Hello everybody. Welcome. I'm uh, out on a walk in the night in San Francisco. In my recent videos, I've explored topics related to a polarity which I've established, or at the very least a complementarity between intellect, which I often think of as a knife. And insight, which I often think of as probably some kind of word or tool like this, but it doesn't come easily to, to mind. Um, healing, or perhaps a kneeling, uh, bringing back together that which had been previously divided, often to astonishing effect. Because we've lived so long in the divisions of intellect, that when healing finally comes, it reforges the entire history of our thought and concern, ideas, inclinations, It's a process that spans the entire existence of our minds. And even a span beyond that, the mm, accumulation of the produce of all of this cutting over the entire history of the evolution of human consciousness. So it's very powerful when it's true and good insight. And of course, there are forms of a mental experience that strongly resemble or mimic insight. And even bring previously distinct things together, but result <clears throat> in something more resembling delusion, illusion, paranoia, or schizophrenia, or mania. Um, and these are simple words to use, but the meanings underlying them, the meanings I, I have anyway, are not simple. They're pretty nuanced, though I use words whose scope is too broad to be clearly communicative of my meaning. One of the great dangers of intellect is it often disposes in a cursory way with context and scope so that someone I know, if they think, for example, um, a certain person was bad to me or intended me harm, that quickly expands to all people of that ethnicity or class or cohort are bad which quickly expands to all people are bad, which quickly expands to everything's bad, nature is bad, the earth is bad, the sun is bad, the universe is bad and evil and wrong, and so on. So this is sort of the opposite of the narrowing of scope commonly employed by intellectual 
articulations. Um, it's a problem that's rooted deep in the logics of language and is particularly endemic to Aristotelian logic and the law of the excluded middle, which isn't a law at all. You know, the, one of the fundamental syllogisms used to introduce Aristotelian logic is all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. And you can see here the fingerprint of set theory. Um, all men is a set. Since all instances of this set have the quality of being mortal, and Socrates is a member of this set, therefore we consider it proven that Socrates is mortal. And in language, this is relatively sensible. I use the word relatively because there are all myriad kinds of features and qualities and extensions and inhibitions that are ignored at the outset by such things. Um, one of the most foundational of them is that we presume to know a quality of all instances of a set to which there can be no exception. And this is kind of a circular logic, right? Because if we begin by defining men as mortal, having this quality of being mortal, then it follows circularly that any instance of that set will have this quality. But what about the scope problem? What is the scope of our understanding of mortality? What is the scope of our understanding of what is meant by men? And particularly and most importantly, what is the scope of words like are and is? All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Again, in language, the structure fits together nicely. No conflicts immediately emerge to our thought if we're thinking in common ways. And so it seems trustworthy. But what we don't know about Socrates in this language is the scope of his necessary inclusion in the class of men. Is that scope perfect and complete? Are there then no exceptions to this scope? Is Socrates only a man? Are there unknowns? Are there in fact unknowables involved? And I would answer yes to both those questions if we're, if we're considering these matters in a serious way. Um, in a way that seeks insight rather than mere validation. And the concern for validation is a driving concern of the intellect. And so it's no surprise that an array of methods that we associate with Aristotelian logic would emerge over the evolution of human consciousness. Nor is it any surprise that they'd become dominant. But there are many other logics, and some of them are far older than Aristotle, and vastly more nuanced, and take into account the problems with scope, incompleteness, absolutism, and all of these things. It would be impossible for anyone to rationally assert that Socrates is and only is a man. This excludes unknowns and unknowables. And 
it seems a rash and terrifying action <laughs> since fundamentally no one knows what a man is or why there are men or what the universe is for or any of these things so though we have convenient language to point out the cuts that have been made by intellect in the sets, the supersets, their, inst their instances, and so on. And all of these seem perfectly familiar to us the same way our silverware does in our drawer. In truth, whatever is actually going on is very unlikely to resemble our abstractions, our habits, our methods, our models, our tokens, our systems of tokens, and the tokens certainly cannot include their reference, for their reference are always transcendental, since their reference must include the minds that bring these reference to awareness. And these are filled with unknowns and unknowables. And by this long introduction, what I mean to say is something very simple. The scope of intellect and rationality is extremely limited compared to the scope of awareness, insight, and consciousness. What I refer to as intellect is an array of habits linguistic behaviors, speech acts, communications acts, and so on. Uh, I'm going to pause for a little bit as I pass some people on the street. Who appear to be getting an Uber or perhaps a Lyft. This is one of my favorite places on the street because there are beautiful sage plants here and their scent, mm. their fragrance is exquisite. The um, The nature of intellect is related to an aspect of human consciousness that is rarely discussed in depth, but is immediately apparent in a variety of everyday activities and situations, such as driving a car, going to the grocery store, going to the bank, going to church, meeting a police officer, reading an author, watching a television show, and so on. There's an underlying sense in human consciousness that's usually invisible to us, but can be made apparent under certain unique circumstances, or sometimes just by introducing the idea of it, which I'm hoping to do here. And that's the, the sense of authorization. Okay. The checker at the checkout stand is authorized to take our money, therefore we expect them to take our money. The traffic signal is authorized to direct our stopping and starting behavior, therefore we expect it to direct our stopping and starting behavior. The doctor is authorized to treat us, therefore we expect the doctor to treat us. And all these things involve something that resembles trance. Um, I'm going to call it authorization trance. And along with authorization, we have a second feature called sequencing. What have you just been exposed to? What were you exposed to along the last route that either your mind or your body or both took over the past minute, three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes? If we pay careful attention to these things, we will see that our attention is often directed, narrowed, inhibited, or sometimes um, liberated by sequencing. 
And sequencing is an important part of inducing hypnosis or trance. Um, these two features, authorization trance and sequencing trance, are fundamental to the experiences of most modern humans, especially in contexts like cities or the internet. <clears throat> It's not my goal to lecture on them now, though I want to introduce them, because the intellect is seeking something that deeply resembles authorization, and this is the idea of proof. Once something is positively proven or, posit or negatively disproven, then from then on, everything we consider will be subject to these proofs or disproofs and so on. And their limitations will be imposed on our thought, awareness, consciousness, expectation, desire, and so on in profoundly complex, deep ways. Intellect in general, and I'm using the term very abstractly, which is a bit unfortunate in that ordinarily I resist such gambits, but in this case I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> that apology changed my train of thought. Um, that was sequencing right there, by the way. When we speak, we're actually sequencing. Uh, and when we lose our train of thought, what happens is the sequence gets misdirected. Intellect, we, in our relationship with intellect, are seeking something that resembles authorization and deauthorization. And this is how you get something like Aristotelian logic. Um, we want to know the facts. The problem with the facts is that the facts will depend on how we make the cuts in the manifold of identity character, purpose, qualities, from everything to something. And since intellect hides this process of making these cuts, we are unconscious of these cuts and the process of making them, and we simply presume that their result is valid or trustworthy. That is delusion. That's a very good definition of delusion. Having made a variety of moves which are, of which we are unconscious, we then presume that the outcome of these moves is veritable. And you can see this everywhere in common human thought, um, maps of identity, qualities, value, and so on. Okay, that's a big owl. I got lucky there. By departing my thread, I reforged it better than the thread that the sequencing I was doing would have resulted in. And this is the power of insight. The power of insight collapses something that was being built, assembled, structured, and then allows for an improved reforging. Um, this is also a capacity familiar to neuroscientists in some interactions between some aspects of right hemispheric activity and left hemispheric dominance under certain conditions. And notice that when I'm speaking, I'm applying limitations. I'm saying some aspects under certain circumstances rather than just saying something like the right hemisphere does this, which would be absurd and ridiculous. These are inclinations of the hemispheres. 
So intellect seeks a sort of dominant, unassailable position, um, <clears throat> which it often may present as factual. Yet there's a fundamental problem here that the right hemisphere, uh, when, how shall I put this, that certain aspects of right hemispheric function are aware of and very suspicious about and will tend to try to ameliorate. And it's the problem I began with earlier. If we don't know what minds are, or what they're doing, or why there are minds, or why there's consciousness, or awareness, or sentience, or any of these things, then we're missing something fundamental about their products, particularly if their products are the result of the inaction of a tool-like aspect that has very narrow scope but palpable utility, that's the problem. Mm. Rather, that's a problem. So what I had intended to talk about tonight was this utility of the intellect. And you know, whenever I'm speaking, I'm nearly always weaving into the topic, a meta topic that I'm fascinated by, which is the evolution of human consciousness over generations of humans from whatever we might consider to have been the first ones, presuming that the sequence of linear history as we are taught to think about it is the right way to think about things, and I don't presume that. I do it because we're familiar with it. And it would be very confusing to introduce methods that would give us other options. Um, that would draw into question the authorization or um, validity dominance of the idea of linear, linear history. There's a perspective from which linear history is very useful, informative, and utilitarian. But there are many perspectives from which it's the most dangerous thing to do. Why would it be dangerous? Well, because it's fundamentally wrong. It's more wrong than it is correct, is the problem. And the same is true with the limitations of scope usually imposed by the intellect on our considerations of superclass, class, set, instance, and so on. The reason it's more wrong is we've excluded the unknowns and the unknowables and then have believed that exclusion to the <laughs> ending in the result of a kind of certainty that is at best unjustified and at worst catastrophic. So, two things happened um, during the origins of the consciousness that we are now largely subject to, uh, though we have some liberty within the field. And the first was the capacity to remember things. And this is a bit like animals caching food in an environment and then later recalling where they have cached the food. Many animals, and I think I should just say organisms, um, have astonishing capacities and modes and forms and methods of employing memory that are very different from ours. Our representational cognition is hugely expensive. It's, it's like a city where all the machines are always on. And every time they iterate a function, they require more energy the next time to iterate that same function. Representational cognition has a reasonable scope of application, but is incredibly narrow and dangerous in its results. And one of those results is machines. And one might reasonably ask, well, what other forms of cognition are there? I guess that depends on how we define cognition, how I define it. 
Um, but mostly what I mean when I use this phrase is using tokens and maps and systems and models to explain to ourselves features of experience. And that's a very post hoc activity, right? It's as if, and some people have argued for this in various aspects of neuroscience, that we have experience and then the intellect, um, coupled with representational cognition, arises and presents explanations and causal relationships and so on to explain which literally means to flatten the experience into something that our thinking mind, which I guess is what I mean by intellect, can grasp. Um, and it's very graspy. It wants a grasp on things. And the things that it grasps are its own produce. So you can see how this becomes quickly self-validating even when it's overtly invalid. If we begin with a different syllogism, something like, the actual nature of existence and experience is fundamentally unknowable. If we start there, rather than with the idea that we can capture it, in tokens and maps and models and explanations and so on. Now we have some liberty. And there's a less severe move we can make that's still liberating, which is the scope of our grasp in intellect is so limited that we should place precedence on all that lies outside it that should be the most important thing to maintain awareness of while we play in the little Lego structured playground of knowledge and nomenclature and so on, names. To return to the animals and the organisms and their memory, if I feed a blue jay a peanut one time that blue jay will remember so much about that experience that it will recognize me probably for the rest of its life. Um, surely, though you and I have been fed food by humans, we do not recognize them for the rest of our lives. Uh, none of us, well, not none. See, here's the completeness of intellect, right? Unless we have an eidetic memory, a photographic memory, we will not remember most of the people who served us food throughout our lives. But a blue jay with a much shorter lifespan than ours and a different relationship with time and identity has an incredible memory. Um, Corvids in clinical studies have demonstrated the ability to remember thousands of caching locations and to find them again, even when they are buried by snow and the landmarks that were present when the food was cached are missing or occluded. So <laughs> the reason I present this is, or my purpose in presenting it, is that Formal representational memory depends upon the caching and retrieval of tokens, words, names, maps of identity, relation, location, timing, all these things. And before our species became formally representational cognitives, we learned to cache probably first something resembling music, 
and later chopped up music, which we can think of as language. Um, and as that process proceeded, the chops became more severe, more expensive in terms of what they did away with and excluded or failed to actively include. And so our relationship with language and knowledge underwent something resembling lossy compression in digital media. And science and technology have radically accelerated that process and continually invent new dimensions to lose access to in our awareness and thought, consciousness, behavior, relationships, and activities. So how did such a dangerous thing succeed? Well, <laughs> it succeeded in part because of its great pragmatic usefulness in a very narrow range of behavior. <clears throat> and one of the ways of thinking about this pragmatic usefulness and this narrow range of behavior involves the word prediction and the idea of prediction. Nearly all of modern science and all of technology arises, in fact, not just not merely technology, societies, nations, cities, all these things, arise by structuring situations and experience in such a way that they become more predictable. And thus in our cities, there's a profuse endeavor to exclude nature. Why would we exclude nature? Nature's unpredictable. If there's an animal in our backyard, we don't know what it's doing. That's a problem. Um, people who are unfamiliar with spiders or centipedes or scorpions are terrified of them because they seem very unpredictable to such people. For people who are familiar with them, they are not unpredictable. Surely they are less predictable than machines, but they are not unpredictable. So, I'm going to be climbing a steep hill here, so you're going to, you're going to hear some huffing and puffing. <laughs> um, by the way, that was me predicting something right there knowing that I will climb a steep hill, I realize that my breathing is going to change and that will be audible to my listeners. So the capacity to be able to predict things set up a series of terrifying sequelae or consequences, not just in human development, but particularly in the evolution of of our minds over, over you know, many thousands of generations of humans or perhaps you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of human lifetimes. And here's the problem. The more we kill off living things, the more desolate and mechanized the terrain in our experience becomes, the greater our predictive ability seems to the intellect and the more powerful. And we get something that resembles security, but is actually a mimetic shadow of security. It mimics security. For everyone knows that a completely secure life spent in a box is an agony. 
There's no experience in there. And there's no novelty. And since there's neither experience nor novelty, there's no adventure. And without adventure, life quickly becomes mechanized and robotic. And we experience dead time. I was looking at an image that I made some years ago the other night and the image was a graph and up near the top of the graph was ecstasy this curve upward curve and then prodigy below that and then communion or active sensing below that. And then below that relationships. And then below that work. And then below that were prison like states where We are deprived of all these things above this position on the graph and are given instead representations of them. Money as the representation of value shows as the representation of meaningful roles, adventures, and so on. Artifacts as the representation of wealth, work as the representation of a meaningful role, And these things are fake. And as we travel down this graph from the top toward the bottom, we're experiencing the loss and conversion of degrees of freedom and diverse dimensionality in our conscious and creative experience these things are being auctioned off permanently. And we find ourselves trapped in the kind of circus that Pinocchio was enslaved by in the story. Something we could call a Potemkin village, which is a prison slavery environment dressed up as a community. Now, obviously, the people in the lower classes will be aware of and experience much more directly the repercussions of this problem, whereas the people in the wealthier classes, as they rise in wealth, um, will have some degree of prophylactic protection from the more severe consequences. Nonetheless, even the wealthy people are trapped in the Potemkin village. So one of the problems that led to the minds we have today was the problem of the efficacy of prediction. Prediction allowed us new degrees of freedom in very specific domains but over time resulted in a collapse of the entire manifold of freedoms into tokenized representations. And that collapse is ongoing and can continue to be accelerated and diversified in infinite ways over time, particularly with the assistance of technology.
which of course was supposed to liberate us from war and disease and poverty, insanity, stupidity, ignorance, destitution, crime, all these things, none of which happened. <laughs> Even one time. <laughs> With every new development came new costs that we were unprepared to predict or evaluate properly or evaluate effectively. So memory led to prediction. And prediction led to the capacity to limit or eliminate living novelty and its multidimensional nature to produce more predictable, tokenized, iterative enactments of functions. And you can see the desire here for utilitarianism. You can also see the desire for authorization. Right? If your predictions become stronger and stronger over time, one is led to believe that the methods you are using are ever more reliable when in fact they can become essentially perfectly reliable just by killing everything. Right? The more dead space and dead time there is, the more accurate one's predictions become. But the dead space and dead time are not admitted by the predictive faculty. <laughs> Therefore, the predictive faculty comes to seem like a god, a great power, a great boon, when in fact, it's an amputation. Um, an inverse hydra of amputations, inhibitions, losses of potential role, activity, creativity, relationship, identity, consciousness, awareness, insight, and so on. All of these things collapse into shadows. in the <clears throat> ongoing uh, momentous development of predictive interest and in technologies. So my goal here was to demonstrate or, or shed some light on part of how we got here. and the parademonic um, aspects of intellect in their endless hunger for proofs, facts, authorizations, inassailable proclamations, and so on. At this point, I'm going to turn back to the insight that most of what is going on is unknowable and unapproachable by intellect. Because whatever's going on isn't a bunch of tokens floating around in some miasma, structural miasma. <laughs> of models and maps and explanations, flattenings. And by the way, what's, what's being flattened is the natural mysteriousness, vitality, um, transcendentalness of the universe and all of its manifestations. So this is why earlier I mentioned a medicine. If we start with 
the awareness that language is a toy, a game we can play, and we must play the game rather than being played by the game. Therefore, we preserve the unknowables, the unknown, and the incompleteness of language in precedence to whatever language may deliver to our awareness or grant us some kind of grasp upon. If we begin there, now we've made an important move, a healing move and an healing move that will protect us so that we can use language without becoming its functions. And we need a similar insight in our personal relationships with all of the features of modern life, technology, ideology, religion, um, societies, nations, medicine, all these things. Prediction, the scope of prediction is much narrower than it appears because it tends to focus on what it succeeds at. It does not count the stuff it doesn't succeed at. So it appears to its own, you know, in its own reflection of itself, it appears almost omnipotent. Yet its actual scope is extremely narrow compared to what's available to us as beings, as organisms, as animals, as humans, and as unknowns. For none of those words or concepts captures our nature. They are cuts and sets and classes and instances in language. What a word means is different from what we mean with words. And if we are wise, we'll, we will realize that words don't have meanings. Humans use words to mean things when they're awake to these possibilities. And what I am trying to mean here is liberation from a vast collection of ancient traps to which our species and our children have long been subject. And if I have succeeded even slightly, I count that a great success. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to learning again together very soon.